All right. Great to be with you today. Um, hi, Joanna. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Judaism. I grew up Jewish. Um, I went to Hebrew school as a kid, and uh, I was bar mitzvahed when I was 13. Uh, when I went and got my Ph.D. after I converted and came back from my mission, I also attended Hebrew Union College, which is next to the University of Southern California, for a reciprocal program. So I went to school with rabbinic students. And so uh, maybe I can just do some basic stuff. I also am uh, super open to any questions you have as I go and be happy to answer any questions. The question, too, often is asked, so what is a Jew? Right? What, in fact, is a Jew? I'll give you a very traditional definition, um, and then I'm going to give you uh, some more nuanced definitions. So you guys know that Jacob, um, who got renamed Israel, uh, he, he had married four women. One of his wives' name was Leah, and um, through Leah and the other wives, they had the house of Israel, um, meaning the 12 tribes, the 12 sons. And through Leah, there was a son named Judah. And so the traditional definition of a Jew is anyone who's a descendant of Judah. Does that make sense? That's Judah, Jew, that's where that comes from. Uh, so that's one definition. Another definition is if you have, this is my, uh, that's the Mediterranean Sea, that's the Sea of Galilee, that's the Dead Sea, there's Jerusalem. Um, when, the two, when Solomon was king, after Solomon was king, the nation, this nation divided into two. And the southern was called Judah, and the northern was called Israel. And so, in another sense, anybody who lived in the southern kingdom was called a Jew. In fact, so when you read the Book of Mormon, Nephi refers to himself as a Jew, not because he's a descendant of Judah, but because he lives in Judah. Did that, did that make sense right there? So just like if I said to you, you know, what are you? You might say, well, what do you mean? And I say, are you an American? And you say, yeah, I'm an American, right? Because you live in America. And so that's kind of how this designation. So I'd say this is kind of the first definition. This is the second definition. And then the Book of Mormon actually gives another one where sometimes the Book of Mormon will refer to all people from the house of Israel as Jews. So that's probably a more uh, l less kind of prolific uh, definition here than these other ones. I have to tell you, um, when I was at Hebrew Union uh, and I was with all these rabbinic students, um, we got into this discussion and I did this, like, you know, in three minutes. And they were like, that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I was like, really? Shouldn't you guys all know that? But anyway, they didn't. And uh, so there's a generation of rabbis who's probably teaching this in some school right now. Um, but this is kind of how that works. That's what Jews are, okay? Any questions about that? Is, that? is that helpful about what a Jew is? How many of you knew Jews growing up? Did anybody know a Jew? Oh, we got a very Jewish-like people growing up. That's cool. I once gave a, um, a fireside in St. Anthony. You know who St. Anthony is? North of here. And there was like 300 kids there, and I said, how many of you have met a Jew? Not a single one of them. Because they're all from St. Anthony, you know what I mean? So I thought that was super interesting that none of them had ever, not ever actually met a Jew. So these are the three definitions, okay? Now, in today's world, there's about 15 million plus or minus Jews. Um, it's super hard to get real accurate statistics because unlike the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you know, they don't count people on Sunday. You know what I'm saying? They're not walking. There's not a guy gets assigned. And birth records are hard. But this is a pretty solid estimate that most researchers believe is pretty accurate. Okay? Um, there's about 7 million Jews that live in the land of Israel. Okay? So there's 7 million uh, there. And there's about 6,500,000 that live in the USA. So that's a lot, right? I mean, that's, that's a ton. And the balance are dispersed. Interestingly, France has a very large population of Jews. Argentina, interestingly, has a large, like Buenos Aires, has a large population of Jews. Yes? That's total Jewish population worldwide. Total Jews worldwide. Okay? Um, and so um, 
it's super interesting, okay? So now, when you say someone's a Jew, um, it's super interesting because, okay, here's what happens. You have, I'm going to give you four categories, okay? So you have orthodox, you have conservative, you have reform, and then I'm going to have another one called traditional or tradition. Okay, so let me, and this is probably the most important part of what I'm going to do to help you understand Judaism. So, um, Orthodox Jews, sometimes when you guys think of Jews, you know, the long black coat, right, and they have the hats, and they have their, um, the payas, which is their sideburns they let grow, they've got beards. Those, th that, the Orthodox Jews are like devout, commandment-keeping uh, they consider the, the Torah to be the literal word of God that Moses literally, like, like we would believe, that God wrote the Ten Commandments with his finger and they want to keep every single commandment, right? So they're going to keep their kosher, they're going to try to keep all the laws, right? That's orthodox, right? Now, the conservative Jews were a response, I'll, so I'll talk about reform first. Reform Jews came around the, the 19th century, Okay, as a response to kind of what they thought was some awkwardness and backwardness about Orthodox Jews. And they wanted to assimilate more in kind of European society. Uh, they wanted to be more able to do things like in terms of uh, universities and also in terms of um, professions. They wanted bankers and deal with people that weren't Jewish. So the reform movement comes along and basically says, uh, we, we're going to reject some of this ultra-orthodoxy and we're going to assimilate into a modern world. Um, and f by the way, we're, gonna speak, we're not going to only speak Hebrew. We're going to speak our, whatever our native language happens to be. It started in Germany, so speak in German. And um, we're going to reject a lot of this kind of very traditional idea. In other words, we're going to reject the idea of it being absolute, that we have to do all these things, and that they're kind of archaic and, and don't have much to do with our current time. So that's Reform Judaism. And then Conservative Judaism kind of, as it is in the middle, kind of thought Reform Judaism had gone too far. You know, that they rejected the kind of the nature of the Torah. They rejected, even in some circumstances, the belief in God and um, the idea of a Jewish people. And they also thought that orthodoxy was too archaic. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Talmud and the Mishnah in a second. But... They thought that was a little too far the other way. So the conservative movement, is it, it, they're quite devout. Uh, they, keep their, they keep kosher. Do you guys know what kosher means? Kosher are the laws in Leviticus on what you can and what you can't eat, right? So most famously, Jews can't eat what? Pork. Pork. That's the most famous, right? I mean, there's other things. And it would be like, for Latter-day Saints, it would be like the word of wisdom, right? So they had their word of wisdom and um, that's keeping a kosher house. And then you have Orthodox Jews who are so scrupulous about the kosher laws. For example, there's a kosher law that says um, you can't really have meat and dairy together. So if you go to Israel and you go to McDonald's, they have McDonald's in Israel, you can't get a cheeseburger, honestly. You'd have to bring your own cheese because they won't do it because you can't have dairy and meat together. But my point though is, I had relatives who actually would have separate plates, separate refrigerators, and wealthy relatives had separate kitchens so that milk and any dairy product could never mix with any kind of meat product, okay? So that's, that's over here. Uh, the reforms start to get rid of that. Even some reform are even saying we're not going to circumcise our children anymore. So you guys know that the boys at eight days are circumcised. Um, and uh, there was even, now that's, they've changed that, they still circumcise, but there was a movement not to do that. The traditional or tradition Jews are Jews who say they're Jews because they were born Jewish, but really have very little, in, in other words, I would say these are like what we call secular, non-religious Jews. Um, do we have an analog for that in Mormonism? I don't know if we do. But this would be somebody who says, I'm Jewish and I love my Judaism. Like I love being Jewish. Never go to synagogue. Don't read Hebrew. Don't keep any of the commandments. 
don't really care about any of that, but I'm Jewish. Isn't that weird? So they have that. Now, interestingly, um, the reform movement of Jews you're going to meet, you're going to meet mostly reformed Jews. Okay? So this, is, this would be number one in terms of population. This is number two. Um, and then these two, this is probably number three, and this is number four in terms of percentage population. In Israel, in Israel, you might think, oh my word, there are a bunch of Orthodox Jews. Not at all. Totally secular Jews. Israel, over half, um, w when they identify, identify as what, you know, traditional Jews, meaning they don't, they're non-religious Jews. They're still very proud of being Jewish, but non-religious Jews. Um, but you have a small minority in Israel that are very orthodox, but they're also very powerful. They have political power, etc. And that kind of drives a lot of what goes on in Israel. Um, so, tr so in the United States, it would be more like this, okay? Yeah, please. So my grandparents over here, right? And then, or great-grandparents, grandparents here, my parents here. Isn't that weird? So my parents even bordered this, but I, I had to go to Hebrew school. I had to do all the stuff. <laughs> so, and sometimes as a kid, I would say, well, you don't go, but I had to go. Isn't that weird? So that's kind of what's going on there. So I've had exposure to all of it, um, and that's kind of what's going on with that. Yes, please. Right, right. They're Orthodox, right. So in Brooklyn, uh, there's a place in Brooklyn, Williamsburg in Brooklyn, and um, it's about 60 blocks, and it's very ultra-Orthodox, very ultra-Orthodox. And the coolest thing ever, if you guys want to have a cool experience, is you go to Williamsburg in Brooklyn on a Friday afternoon because they're preparing for the Sabbath on Saturday. And they all come out in their gorgeous clothes. And the women wear their beautiful dresses and the hats. And, and everyone's getting ready for the Sabbath because their Sabbath starts at sundown. So Friday afternoon, you go. And by the way, they'll see you and they know instantly, you know, that you are a Gentile, right? Even though we're actually the true ones. But anyway, they, they would be like instantly noticed. And they would literally, like Old, New Testament, cross the street. Like let's say you're walking down the street the rabbi or the Orthodox Jew would literally cross the street to not have any interaction because, you know, they're not going to talk to you. And they speak among the Orthodox Jews in the United States. They speak Yiddish, not Hebrew. They only speak Hebrew when they are studying Torah because Hebrew is the language of God Almighty. And if you speak Hebrew for kind of like, you know, pedestrian things, it's blasphemy. So they speak Yiddish, and they also speak fluent English, but among the, themselves, they'll speak Yiddish. And, and people ask me, what's Yiddish? Has anybody heard Yiddish before? So good, I got some good people. Yiddish, this is what I say Yiddish. My mom and dad, my grandparents spoke Yiddish. Okay, and Yiddish is, people say, Brother Baron, what's Yiddish? Yiddish is Hebrew, German, Polish, and some maybe a few other Slavic languages, Yahtzee. That's what Yiddish is, like literally this combination language. And it binds Jews worldwide because you could be an Italian Jew or you could be an American Jew, but if you speak Yiddish, you can talk to each other. And so, we, in fact, we were in Italy uh, when I was a little kid, and my dad saw this guy, and he said some Yiddish stuff, just threw it out there, and the guy immediately responded, and then they became fast friends. It'd be like if we were in some foreign country and you were like, I am a child of God. And hoping that somebody would be like, I'm a Mormon. So <laughs> threw the Yiddish out, and that's kind of what they speak. Okay, so the Hasidic, the Hasidic Jews are here. And I'll, the, there's, it's a super interesting background to the Hasids. And so in modern terms, the Hasidic Jew and the ultra-Orthodox Jews or Orthodox Jews are kind of together. A Hasidic Jew was, in the 1700s, uh, there was a man named Baal Shem Tov, which means kind of master of the good name. He was a rabbi. 
And he felt like that Orthodox Jews at the time didn't have enough joy in their worship. That they'd taken kind of the heart out of Torah study, out of keeping the commandments. And so he created this movement where they would dance and they would cry and they would kind of, you know, be very excited about things. And the Orthodox kind of competed against it, but eventually the Hasidic movement kind of over turned it all, and that's really the Orthodox Jew today. But it's kind of an interesting history of how that all came about. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, this idea of joy that uh, there's a passage in Isaiah chapter 6 that the, the glory of the earth is full of the glory of God. And so he was like, if the earth is full of the glory of God, that means we should have joy in all the things we do. And I thought that was super cool. So anyways, that's where Hasids come from. So most Orthodox Jews consider themselves Hasidic Jews. Now there's some that don't, but most do. Awesome. Okay, now let me just tell you a little bit about the view of Scripture. So the Torah, they generally will refer to as only the five books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, they divide the, what we call the Old Testament into three divisions, and they call it the Tanakh. So there's the Torah, and then they have the Nevim. Nevim are the prophets, and they have the major prophets and the minor prophets. So Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Jeremiah are the major prophets, and then the 12 minor prophets, right, starting with Hosea down to Malachi. Then, so that's the, that's, that would be the Tanakh. The Torah has the highest priority. So Genesis through Deuteronomy, because that's Moses. Moses has the highest priority of all prophets. And so you've got Moses, and you've got that, and then you've got the prophets, major and minor. I told you, then the, the Ketuvim are the writings. That's Psalms, right? First and Second Chronicles, Job, Esther, Ruth. All that stuff are kind of the writings or the historical portion, okay? Some of the poetic stuff. Um, now, what happened was they believe this. They believe when God gave the written law, he also gave an oral tradition to Moses to help interpret the law. And that that oral tradition was never written down. And then in about 200 what we, AD, Jews started to get concerned that the diaspora, the scattering, that they were going to forget it. So they actually wrote it down into 63 tractates. It's called the Mishnah. And you, could, you can go online, and I think there's a free Mishnah. I think there's an online Mishnah. And it is, so what it is, it's like, so let's say I said, I want you guys to study everything on the Sabbath, okay? And you were like, oh, I'll go on LDS.org, and I'm going to look up Sabbath. That's kind of what the rabbis did. So there's 63 tractates in the Mishnah on topics, so instead of having to go like in 200 B.C. or 200 A.D. and having to go read the whole Old Testament to find out what it says about the Sabbath, they put it in one, like, you know, file, one chapter. This is everything on the Sabbath. This is everything on ritual offerings. This is everything on the holiness code. This is everything on marriage. And so that's how it's organized, right? It's like the Mormon doctrine of Judaism from way back. Then they have that. Then they had rabbis talking about that for centuries. And the rabbis talking about that for centuries is called the Gemara. So that's the rabbis, you know, how are we going to apply this? And so the Mishnah and the Gemara together are called the Talmud. Some of you may have heard the Talmud. And again, I think you can go online. I think you can get the entire Babylonian, or yeah, Talmud online. And, you know, it gives you minute instructions on how to do everything. So Jews, like if a Jew came to like uh, Brother Schmidt's Old Testament class, they might be super intrigued that he used the Old Testament. But then they'd say, well, what about rabbinic commentary? What, what about what the rabbi said about that? And you might say, I don't really care what the uninspired rabbi had to say about that. But here's what a prophet said. Do you know what I mean? So they, they, look, at, they look at it as kind of very together. In fact, sometimes they'll privilege the Talmud over the written word because they believe it's inspired as well. Okay? So I had, I teach Hebrew here at BYU-Idaho, and I had a young man from, uh, who was a Jewish convert, recent Jewish convert, who spoke fluent Hebrew, and he was in my class, 
and he would always push me on, well, wh what about this rabbinic commentary? And what about this rabbinic commentary? And I was always like, I don't really care, you know, what that rabbi said. I mean, it's interesting, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't have a lot of bearing on what I think of that particular verse. Does that make sense? Okay, so you have, this is the breakdown of Jews. You know, now know how they feel about the written word and the oral law. Um, and that's, that's kind of where. Um, so when I was growing up, real briefly, when I was growing up, I loved, my, by the way, my parents are awesome. They came to, I spoke at devotional last week. They were at devotional. They're very Jewish. Um, they loved it here, by the way. They love BYU-Idaho. But anyway, um, I had lots of questions growing up. What happens when you die? Where do we come from? That any CTR 5 class could answer. They couldn't answer. Jews can't answer. I mean, as elaborate as the theology is, uh, they don't have concrete answers to some of these things that I really wanted to know. So I was a seeker. Even when I was going to Hebrew school, I was asking the rabbis all these questions, you know. And they were nice about it. They just, you know, don't know. In fact, I'll never forget, I had um, one conversation where I said, so what happens when you die? And my mom and dad said, well, your memory lives on. I was probably nine. And I thought, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and here's why, because uh, my rebuttal was, well, Hitler's memory lives on. So his memory lives on, my memory lives on, but I don't live on? And they're like, no, just your memory. It's like, yeah, not interested. And so I became a searcher, and eventually, when I was 18, I found the church. Um, but I'd searched all kinds of religions. Even when I was very active in Judaism, I was always going to other religions and always, you know, learning and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. But I want you to know my parents were great, wonderful family, loving. My grandparents, everyone was awesome. Um, Jews get some things really well. And one of the things they get is authority. And so, number one, they don't do, there's two reasons they don't do animal sacrifices. No temple. And even if they had a temple, no one to officiate in it. Isn't that interesting? So they, they will not perform sacrifices because they know they're not what? They're not Levites. They're not Aaronic priesthood holders. So they get that. So they have it already. They have the Talmud is full of stuff on how to do it. No one does it. Because who would do it? So when, when the scattering happened, final scattering really occurred in 70 AD at Titus, when Titus came to Jerusalem, right? When that scattering happened and Jews were worldwide, they lost the thread of who the descendants really were of the Aaronic priesthood. And so they had to back off then, since I don't have the authority to perform the ordinances, I can't perform them. So they recognize it and just hold. So Orthodox Jews, the Temple Mount in Israel, in Jerusalem, they believe the Temple Mount is where the Holy of Holies was and where parts of the Temple were. Orthodox Jews won't go up there for fear they might actually step where the Temple was. And if they're not Aaronic priesthood holders, they would have to be killed. So they won't go up there. So that, that's super cool that they get that, right? They have, but it's always, it's so, the records are so sparse, and especially because of persecution. So ra uh, uh, synagogues burned down, their papers destroyed. In other words, it's so, I'm, I do Jewish genealogy because of my family. Oh, it's so hard. Because of generations of persecution uh, and of destruction. So they try, but it doesn't. So the word Kohen means priest in Hebrew. So sometimes you might have met a Jew whose last name is Kohen. So some of them think that's the line, but no one's sure. And if you're not sure, God won't approve it, can't do it. Crazy, huh? So Orthodox Jews have more uh, a, a, a salvation concept, more in line. But reform, not. Okay, they do not. It's like, psh, that's it. You die. In fact, w uh, I have a quote from a rabbi who says, in the final analysis, everything, everything crumbles into nothingness. Reform Jews are existentialists. I mean, this goes into a broad conversation. So what happened was, I'll give you the short 30-second version. World War II and the Holocaust turn Jews reform because they believe that 
Okay, so if you believe kind of what they're believing and the Holocaust happens, who do they blame? God. So they left Judaism and said, we'll be Jewish because we're born Jewish, but we don't believe anything anymore. So it really disheartened them. Really. So if you meet Jews like of that generation, yeah, they're generally reform or just tradition because they believe God broke the covenant. Um, so pretty interesting, right? Okay, so um, Moses, Joshua, they're all there. Um, period of Judges, good, except it's a super weird book and they're in apostasy. Samuel comes along and for Samuel kind of restores things. Then you get the three kings. You get Saul, who I'm pretty sure was bipolar. And then <laughs> David, who had the reign, but then, right, committed adultery and then committed murder. And then you have Solomon, who ends up intermarrying with other, for political alliance with other women. And then the, the, the tribes divide, two tribes. Prophets come and say, you guys got to repent, you got to repent. In 721 B.C., the northern tribes over here, the, the ten tribes here get scattered. Poof. We don't know anything about that. And they've been scattered since then, except we're gathering them now. So you're probably from Ephraim, right? Yeah, you've been gathered. So ten tribes lost, getting gathered. Judah stays. So they stay, they stay, till they stay. And then Jeremiah comes along. And this is Lehi. This is the story of the Book of Mormon. And now they get scattered. Poof. But they come back. They come back. And that's the Jews at the time of Jesus. But they reject Christ. 70 A.D., final scattering. So since 70 A.D., Jews have been wanderers around the earth. But they, to a certain degree, have kept their identity, right? Because they've lived together, usually outside of the town and then been hated and persecuted, they become a hiss and a byword, Book of Mormon, right, prophecy, worldwide, worldwide. And, and so, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of what's going on. It's been a scattering, a scattering, and a scattering. Apostasy. Right, apostasy, 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 scattering, destruction, persecution, pogroms. So, for example, my, my dad's mom, okay, so my great-grandfather on my dad's side, they're living in Russia in some little teeny shtetl, that's Yiddish, like a little ghetto. And Russians, for fun, would come in on their horses and shoot Jews, just for fun. And so my great-grandpa decided, this is in the 1880s, I'm going to America. We're going to go to America. They, had no, they didn't have money, so they had to escape Russia. So he escaped. And my grandma would tell this story about how they had to bribe guards and they took the Trans-Siberian Railroad, and they didn't go through Europe. They went to Vladivostok, Russia, then to Kobe, Japan, and then in the steerage class to Seattle. And I thought, I heard that story my whole life. I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't, is that true? I found the manifests from the ships from Vladivostok to Kobe to Seattle. I was like, my grandma's telling the truth. <laughs> and uh, her name was Sadie Bachman, by the way, my grandma. If you've ever seen Fiddler on the Roof, that's her. She is like right out of that movie. They were Russian Jewish peasants who escaped to America for a better life. Okay, that's, okay, I'm going to tell you this. So if you would have asked me when I was 17 or 16, what do you think of Christ or my parents or my grandparents, they would have said, we don't. So I lived 18 years in my home growing up. There was not one single conversation about Jesus. Never once. So people are like, oh, Jews think Jesus is a prophet. No, they don't. They don't. It's just not in their psyche. It's not in a file folder. Um, and so it's just not part of who they, they just, it just doesn't come up. Right? It just doesn't come up.